Hello, good evening. Welcome to our final meeting of the year. This is the Recreational Astronomy Night meeting for December of the Toronto Center RISC. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Markov. I'll be introducing the speakers uh, this evening, uh, as I do almost every month. And um, well, let's uh, begin by letting you know what's going on tonight. Um, our first speaker is going to be Chris Vaughn, um, presenting the sky this month. Uh, followed by Clay Davis. He'll talk to us about building a Newtonian telescope for visual wide field and air travel. And um, instead of the third speaker this evening, we're going to convene our annual general meeting. Um, it was supposed to have happened uh, at the end of November, but uh, there was no time. Uh, so we're having that tonight. And uh, also a warm welcome to our viewers on YouTube. Hi, guys. And uh, Let's see, without further ado, I think we can probably get started with our presentations. Come on down, Chris. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. This is actually the sky this six weeks. But uh, here we go. Lots to, lots to talk about this month. Okay. Oops. Home. Sorry. Get home. Page down. And we're done. And we're done. All right. So as I normally do, um, during a talk, I'm going to give you some background on some space exploration news, and there's a couple of big things happening this month in history, and then for observing, we'll get into uh, the various things happening with the sun, the moon, the planets, the dwarf planets. We've got a comet to look at. We've got uh, some uh, occultations and eclipses happening, and then I'll highlight some variable stars, double stars, and early winter targets when we get to the end. And I will be uploading all the content in the, in the presentation to the... Um, um, rasco.ca website. All right, so in case you're sleepy and you want to fall asleep, I'll just give you the spoiler alert up front. So we've got uh, three meteor showers to look forward to, the Geminids, Ursids, and Quadratants. We've got uh, Comet 46P Wartonen reaching its perigee and perihelion maximum brightness on the 16th. Winter solstice, of course, on the 21st, which gives us our nice long observing nights. And then we've got uh, opportunities to watch Algol brighten from its minimum. We have new horizons passing uh, a new world in the solar system on January 1st. We've got, uh, at some point in January, a SpaceX Falcon 9 crew uh, capsule test launch, uh, three evening lunar occultations, and then we've got a dark blood supermoon uh, in the uh, third week of January. Oh, and the SpaceX Falcon Heavy is supposed to launch sometime early in 2019 as well. All right, so here's a few of the launches listed. I'm not going to go through what they all are. You'll see there's a lot of um, ComSats and Earth observation satellites in there. Uh, one thing you'll notice at the bottom is we've got uh, this sad item. Oh, I can't get a pointer here. Sir? Oh, it's on the right screen. All right. Went the wrong way. Here we go. Is the uh, replacement of the Iridium satellites. That's happening fast, and right now we're down to maybe one or two in the week, uh, per week over the GTA. In terms of the, um, the manned space, crewed space flight, I should say, we've got uh, highlighted here the Falcon 9 rocket, possibly the first week of January. Um, that'll be the, um, the Crew Dragon capsule, as is shown in the photograph here. And then sometime early in 2019, as I said, the Falcon Heavy launch. That'll be the second Falcon Heavy launch. And then down here at the bottom is uh, an interesting one. That's um, China, um, India is sending its second mission to the moon. The Tron, Chandra Dryan 2 will have an orbiter, uh, a Vikram lander, and a rover. So that'll be something to watch for as well. Okay, the big news on January 1st is that the New Horizons spacecraft is going to make its flyby of 2014 MU69, which has been nicknamed Ultima Thule. And uh, that's a, a graphic showing its position in, uh, in the solar system with respect to Pluto and the inner planets. Um, occultation measurements of the object uh, indicate right now that it's either dual lobed or possibly a binary, a binary um, object. We're not too sure yet. 
But anyway, at, uh, on January 1st, um, just after midnight, so that's 12.30 a.m. on January 1st, is when the flyby will actually occur. Just in case you're interested, the object is position is um, uh, in the northwest um, evening sky in Sagittarius, but it's cl too close to the sun to get a look at that patch of the sky right now. And here are the, here are the specifics. So um, you can see that the red bar across the top is the sort of timeline path of the spacecraft. Each tick would represent a minute. The sun's distance is 43.3, and the Earth's distance from the spacecraft will be 44.3 astronomical units, or times the mean Earth-Sun separation. And that gives the radio signals uh, travel time from the spacecraft back to Earth of more than six hours. So it'll be actually more than six hours before we know what happened during the flyby. But it does occur uh, just after we ring in the new year at about 12.30 a.m. on, on uh, January 1st. And I've converted the speed in kilometers per second into uh, kilometers per hour, so 51,948 kilometers per hour. And this, the uh, distance between the spacecraft and Ultima Thule will be only a third as far as it was from Pluto. So we should have even more um, high resolution imagery of the surface. The other big thing happening right now is that the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is currently taking up position um, at a safe distance from the asteroid Bennu. It's spending the next um, month or so um, mapping very carefully the gravitational field and the shape of the asteroid and so that it can determine an, a, an approach for the future, um, the time when it comes in to take a sample off the asteroid. So on December 31st, it's going to move closer to the asteroid. And then on February, it's going to descend to its final close-in survey orbit of 1.4 to 2 kilometers off the surface of, the, uh, of Bennu. And then um, I guess it's the special day, July 4th, they're going to go in for their sample collection July 4th of 2020. And then the idea is to have the sample get returned back to Earth and a crash land or parachute land in Utah in the desert on September of 2023. Uh, the latest news this week was that the instruments on board the spacecraft have detected the presence or evidence for water molecules uh, bound up in the asteroids. That's pretty exciting. Um, another cool part of this mission is that there's a Canadian element to it. So uh, we've contributed the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter, or OLA, and that little instrument you can see is um, tucked in the, uh, the right-hand the right side of the uh, spacecraft's upper deck there. And the purpose of this is it uses a LIDAR, so it's a, it's a laser ranging measurement technique, which will carefully measure the travel time, travel distance between the spacecraft and the surface of Bennu, and eventually create an ultra-high resolution ultra-high accurate um, 3D model of the surface of the, of the asteroid. This is just a sample of a mock-up of a topographic uh, model that was created in the lab. All right, so the other news this week is that um, recently we had the Mars InSight mission land on Mars on November 26. And uh, what I thought was really interesting was that um, even though it doesn't have microphones on it, it does have a seismic monitor, a seismic sensor, and that seismic sensor has been able to detect the fluttering of the solar panels as the winds on Mars fl flutter the solar panels. And so they've created this little one-minute video. Whoops, let's go back. One-minute one minute video. Let's go back over here. Got to go back on my other screen here.
I just thought that was cool to hear the winds on Mars. So the Mars 2020 rover, which will launch in 2020, will have actual microphones on board. So we'll be able to actually hear the winds in uh, audible range. All right. Uh, just a little bit of summary of what the, um, what's going on in terms of exploration in the solar system. And of course, as I highlighted, the New Horizons mission, the Mars InSight mission, and the uh, asteroid Bennu OSIRIS-REx mission up yonder. So in this month in history, we've got a number of people having astral birthdays. Uh, actually, yesterday, we had the birthday of Annie Jump Cannon, who was a pioneer in stellar classification at the Harvard Observatory. We have um, Tico Brise, who was a pioneer in naked eye astronomy. His birthday is on Thursday, or Friday, I guess. And then on the 16th, we have Arthur C. Clarke, prolific sci-fi author and um, kind of the inventor of geosynchronous satellites. Then on December 16th, we have E.E. E. Barnard, American astronomer, astrophotographer, pioneer in proper motion. And here's the star that's named after him, which is the high proper motion Barnard star. So each, each um, image in the GIF is of one year's difference. And then in uh, December 20th, we had the passing of Carl Sagan back in 1996. We have December 25th, we have the birthday of Sir Isaac Newton and his Newtonian telescope, which he invented. On December 27th, we can honor Johannes Kepler, who was a contemporary of Brahe and uh, invented the laws of planetary motion. And then in uh, 1882, we have the birthday on December 28th of Arthur Eddington, astronomer, and developed the first uh, stellar mass luminosity relationship. And of course, we recently lost Stephen Hawking, but his birthday is on January 8th, and we'll probably want to remember that forever on from now. And then we have Robert Woodrow Wilson, co-discoverer of the cosmic microwave background radiation. His birthday is in January. Then in January 8th, we, um, we have the passing of Galileo Galilei at age 78. But on the bright side, we have the birth of Doctor Who <laughs> in 1908. <laughs> and then January 15th, we have the passing of um, uh, the anniversary of the passing of John Dobson. He died at eight, age 98. He left an amazing legacy of uh, public outreach astronomy and uh, uh, a lot of telescopes that we all have at home, thanks to him and his, his pioneering efforts. Uh, and then Jill Tarter, her birthday's on January 16th, and uh, we wish her well. She's doing great. All right. Now, in space exploration, we have the anniversary of the SOHO, Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, launch in 1995. We have Venera 7 becoming the first spacecraft to land on another planet, uh, Venus, in 1970. We have in 2006, again, the New Horizon spacecraft launched in that year for its trip to, to Pluto and beyond. And in 2004, our Opportunity rover landed in January. And in 1967, unfortunately, that's when we lost the crew of Apollo 1 in the, in the fire on the pad. And then uh, later in the month, or the next day on, the, on that month, the shuttle Challenger loss. Uh, December 13, 1920, we have the first diameter of a star, Betelgeuse, being measured by Francis Pease using an interferometer at Mount Wilson Observatory. That was probably this, the face he had when he, when he got the measurement. Uh, and then in uh, 1672, uh, Cassini discovered Saturn's moon Rhea. I thought this was a great picture. This is um, the first photograph of M31 back in 1888. And it was the first, one of the first proofs that those fuzzy objects in the distance aren't nebulas, that they're actually galaxies, other, other worlds. Other island universes, I guess you want to say. And then in 1801, we have the uh, Piazzi discovering series. And then uh, between January 4th and 15th, 1610, Galileo took his brand new spyglass and pointed it at the heavens and observed all kinds of discoveries and moons and craters on the moon and spots on the sun and moons around Jupiter and phases of Venus and the stars of the Milky Way were not just one solid mass, but were individual, individual stars shining in the sky. In 1839, we have Thomas Henderson publishing the first stellar parallax measurement. And then in 1969, the first optical pulsar, which is uh, one of the stars in the center of the Crab Nebula, uh, using a 36-inch telescope at Kitt Peak. And in 1929, Edwin Hubble published his paper declaring, declaring that the universe is expanding, and that's his, uh, his data plot from his paper, distance versus um, uh, recession velocity. All right, so now into observing. 
the uh, Scott, the Globe at Night program is underway again for 2019, and the campaigns uh, this year in the early part of the year are for using the constellation of Orion. And so what you do is you go out at your observing location and you see uh, how dim the stars in Orion you can see and, and then report that to the Globe at Night organization and they compile that information to produce light pollution maps and, and keep track on the, the distribution and the trends in light pollution globally. All right, sunrise and sunset. So we've got uh, eight hours, 59 minutes of daylight uh, now and we'll have uh, nine hours and 49 minutes of daylight by the uh, next meeting on January, 30, on January 30th. Before then, we have the northern winter solstice on December 21st and Earth at perihelion on uh, January 2nd at midnight. Astronomical twilight, if, if you're um, unaware, um, the sky is not truly dark until the sun is more than 18 degrees below the horizon. And so right now, astronomical twilight is ending at 6.24 p.m. and starting again at 5.58, and that gives us 11 hours and 34 minutes of imaging time, which is plenty. And uh, we're actually getting about 45 seconds more imaging time per day until we get to the, to the solstice. By the time we have our next meeting, though, uh, we're down to 10, and 10 hours and 52 minutes of imaging time, and uh, we're starting to lose it at more than two minutes a day, darkness at that point. And there's just the graph for the year. So the phases of the moon, we've got uh, the first quarter on the 15th of December this weekend. And we've got the full moon on the 22nd, last quarter on the 29th, and finally we have the, the new moon happening on January 5th, and that'll be a partial solar eclipse. And I've got some more information on that in a minute. And then first quarter on the 14th, and the next full moon on January 21st. That'll be a lunar eclipse and a supermoon, as I highlighted at the start. And last quarter again at the end of the month. So this uh, partial solar eclipse is actually going to cover... Uh, northern China and into Siberia, and then sweep down through the Aleutian Islands and end in the North Pacific Ocean. So it's not really something that's uh, worth driving to Acton for. But uh, if you want to watch it online, I've got the times in uh, Eastern, time men Eastern Times mentioned there, uh, 7.27 p.m. to 10, 10, 12 p.m. Eastern Time on January 5th, with greatest eclipse occurring around uh, 8.41 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, here's the total lunar eclipse happening on January 5th. So this will be a so-called perigean total lunar eclipse. In other words, a supermoon, for those who like to use the flashy terms. And uh, this one's going to be particularly dark and deep because the moon will be traveling deeply through the, the Earth's shadow, deep in the umbra. And uh, what's interesting is that it's an extra long totality of over an hour. Um, note that at full totality, you'll have the beehive cluster, um, M44, sitting just uh, seven degrees to the west of the moon. So you can take a look for that while the moon is nice and dark. And here are the timings. So basically, uh, totality would begin around 11.41 p.m., uh, maximum eclipse at 12.13 a.m., and then totality ending around 12.43 a.m. Yep. The date is January 5th, right at the top there. Sorry. Oh, is it the 21st? 2021st, I'm sorry, I'll fix that, yeah. That's using cut and paste on a slide, sorry. All right, All right what are the planets up to this uh, next little while? So Mercury is in the, in the midst of, a, of an excellent pre-dawn uh, apparition in the eastern pre-dawn sky. Um, it reaches greatest elongation on the 21st, and its disk will be waxing fuller and shrinking in size uh, through the uh, end of the next uh, month. It will reach superior conjunction on the 30th of the month, and you can look for uh, Jupiter to be one degree uh, south of it on December 21st. Uh, Venus is in a lengthy pre-dawn apparition as well. It's uh, reaching, going to reach its maximum brightness of minus 4.6 on the 6th of January. And uh, during January, it'll wax in phase and uh, shrink in its disk size. And it'll pass uh, only 2.3 degrees north of Jupiter on the 22nd and be close to the moon during daylight hours on the 31st. So uh, there would be an opportunity to see if you can spot Venus using the moon as your guide uh, during the day on the 31st. Mars, Mars is remaining visible for the next uh, good while in the south and western sky after dusk. As the entire sky is drifting west, Mars is rapidly uh, traveling east in its orbit, so it's kind of holding its position in the sky. And, um, but it will be uh, decreasing in magnitude and shrinking in disk size uh, throughout the duration, and the moon will be um, nearby 
on the 12th. Jupiter's recently passed opposition, so it's now uh, joined the other planets in the pre-dawn eastern sky. It rises about 6.30 a.m. right now. And um, it's going to, as I said, it's going to pass close to Venus on the 22nd. Uh, here's another little fun thing that, that Jupiter will be doing is on the uh, 16th of January, Jupiter will be only 15 um, arc seconds north, or 15 arc minutes north of the bright globular cluster, NGC 6235. Saturn is uh, buried in the western twilight in the evening sky. Um, it will be uh, in conjunction with the sun on January 2nd and then reappear in the eastern pre-dawn sky after mid-January. So Uranus and Neptune are available for viewing right now. Uh, they're good east, uh, uh, Uranus is a good eastern target in, the, uh, in eastern Pisces. It's about one degree north of the star um, Omicron Piscium, which is a, a naked eye star that I've got labeled there. And there's a little, you can see that the path that I've drawn there has a little um, V shape to it. So it's going to end a retrograde loop on January 6th and then start heading eastward again slowly. Uh, Neptune, Neptune is in Aquarius. And uh, right now Mars has been near Neptune, but Mars is pulling away right now. Um, but you can see that um, to find Neptune, you can use these three naked eye stars, Lambda, Psi, and Phi, Aquarii. It's sort of um, inside that little triangle closer to the to the um, easter, uh, western end and moving east uh, through the triangle. Uh, if you're interested in looking at asteroids and minor planets, uh, Juno is a good target right now. It's an all-night target up in the border between Taurus and Eridanus. It's a magnitude of plus uh, 7.78. There's the path from tonight through to the uh, January 30th meeting. And then you can also find Vesta uh, low in the west until mid-January. Ceres is in the eastern pre-dawn sky in Libra. And Pallas is a post-midnight target in the constellation of Virgo. Uh, if you want to look at variable stars, so Algol is an easy starting one. It's, um, it's a uh, eclipsing binary star that normally sits at a magnitude um, of about 2.2. Uh, but every 2.87 days, it drops to magnitude 3.4 and back over a span of about 10 hours. So if you start by watching at its minima, you can watch it brighten, or if you wanted to, if you know when the minima uh, will happen, and you can find the minima listed in the observer's handbook, you could also start with it at full brightness and, and note it as it drops down. But the next two uh, conveniently timed minima for us would be December 28th at 6 p.m., and then January 17th at 7.49 p.m. So that would be the time you'd start checking it and then come back about five hours later, just before bed maybe, and then uh, see, how, see how it's brightened up. Uh, Myra is another um, variable star. Now, this is a different kind. It's a pulsating variable star. It's the brightest of its class. And uh, it's a low-temperature red supergiant, or red M7 class star, about two to 300 light years away. And it's located um, kind of in the neck of Cetus. I've got it labeled with a yellow label up there. And uh, it's got a 110-day 110 110 rise uh, from about magnitude 9.5 up to magnitude 3 or so, and sometimes even brighter. And then it takes 220 days to decline. So here's the, uh, the last 330 days taken off the um, American, American Association of Variable Star Observers website uh, for MIRO. And you can see that we're, we're sort of near the peak right now. So the, the current date would be the, the last date on the right, the latest date on the right. In terms of double stars, uh, we thank Blake Nancaro for posting suggestions for double stars, double stars. Uh, on the forum and on the website from time to time. I've highlighted three that I think are, are, are fairly easy for beginners and also are really spectacular. So we have Sigma Orionis, which is up near Alnitak. And it's, it's actually a multiple star system that's shaped like a dart, sort of like a narrow arrow. It's about eight, uh, eight um, arc minutes long, and it's about 49 arc minutes southwest of Alnitak. Then there's Iota Cancri over in Cancer. It's a blue and yellow uh, pair separated by 30 and a half arc seconds. And then one of the nice ones down here in um, Canis Major is uh, 145 CMA. And if you've got a go-to telescope, you might have to plug in HR 2764. But it's a, it's a winter albario, basically. It's a blue and orangish or yellowish stars um, separated by 26 arc seconds. In terms of what minor planets are up to these days, so. We're here, we're near the end of the year now, so of now we've discovered up to now 1,867 new 
near-Earth asteroids or objects. Those are the red dots in the animation. And then we've got 8,474 new minor planets for the year. That's the green dots. And we just keep finding more and more of them all the time. And 41 brand new comets for this year alone. So comets, the big one to watch for if the skies would ever clear up for us, is uh, comet 46P Wirtanen. And it's a periodic comet, returns every 5.4 years. But it just happens that this year when it returned, its perihelion position is close to Earth in Earth's orbit. So we're actually going to have a perigee and a perihelion all at the same time for that particular comet. On the 16th, there's the light curve. It's not that up to date, but you can see it sort of peaking around magnitude 4, which should be naked eye visibility under dark skies away from the light polluted skies. It's certainly visible in binoculars, uh, people have reported. I haven't yet seen it myself, but I keep trying. And here's its path over the next little while. So it's in the northeastern evening sky. It culminates about uh, 10 p.m. or a little after that. And when it's at peak brightness, it's going to be just below the Pleiades. So it'll be um, a few degrees below the Pleiades on the 16th. And after the 23rd, it'll become a, para a circumpolar object. And you see it'll sweep uh, sort of north or uh, right to left in the sky, passing through um, Auriga and into, uh, eventually into Ursa Major. And you've got a few uh, milestones here. It's going to pass um, 1.25 degrees southeast of the northern Trifid Nebula on the 19th. And we've got uh, one degree east of Capella on the 23rd. And then we've got four uh, arc minutes south of the Pancake Galaxy, NGC 2685, on the 16th. So if it's still bright enough, it might be a, a nice through the telescope photo opportunity. There's another comet that's available right now. It's 38P Stefano Terma. That's a long 38-year period comet. It's an all-night target in the constellation of Lynx. But it's, uh, it's about at its brightness, a bright peak now of about magnitude 9. So it's uh, going to need uh, definitely a telescope to look at that. And there's this light curve. So meteor showers. We've got three showers coming up. We have the Geminides, which are one of the strongest showers of the year. They're uh, already active now, and they'll peak uh, this Thursday, this Thursday um, before dawn. So we have an early setting crescent moon that'll help keep the sky dark if the clouds will go away. And uh, these meteors are often intensely um, colored and slower than average because we think the, the particles that produce the shower are derived from a, a more rocky body, an asteroidal body, called 3200 Phaethon. The Ursids are coming up from the 17th to the 23rd, and they'll peak before dawn on the 22nd. The irradiant for the Ursids is uh, just north of Kochab, the star Kochab in uh, Ursa Minor. And uh, that's going to give us, a, that's going to have a full moon that night, so that'll spoil the show for us. And the quadrantids. So the quadrantids will be active in early January. They'll peak on the evening of Thursday, January 3rd. That's when we'll be heading through the, the uh, most dense part of the shower for, of the debris field. But the best time to watch for them will be before dawn on Friday morning. And there'll be no moon, so the sky will be nice and dark for us. That's an intense peak, but it's short. It's only about six hours in duration. And they could sometimes get up to 100 per hour. There's um, often bright fireballs in that meteor shower. Now, that cost, this um, meteor shower is named for an abandoned constellation called Quadranus Muralis, which we are curious about where that is. It's kind of above uh, Bootes and Canis Venicidi, and there's Corona Borealis down here on the lower left, so you can sort of get a sense. It's up near, sort of between Draco, Hercules, and Bootes, and um, uh, Corona Borealis. So in terms of looking at... Um, Man-made objects in the sky, there's the International Space Station, are currently doing uh, evening passes until December 16th, and those are mostly between 5.15 and 6.30 in the evening. And then a morning pass series begins on the 22nd to January 13th, and most of those are between 5.30 and 7 a.m. And then um, before our next meeting, there's another chance for another evening series of, of ISS passes to commence on January 20th. And here's a list of a few of them. They're going to be in the handout that will upload to the website. Uh, there's a really nice bright one on the 8th of January predicted to be minus 3.9 magnitude and very high, nearly overhead. Uh, the iridium flares, you need to catch them while you can. They're nearly, they'll be soon be gone forever. I'm only noting about one or two per week now in my skylights. Uh, but essentially, most of them are occurring right now between 6 and 7.30 p.m. in the evening. 
and 5.30 and 7.30 a.m. in the morning. And if you want to know when a Liridium flare will be happening for your location, you just want to go to heavensabove.com and enter your location, or you can subscribe uh, to it. You can have a tablet app, or you can uh, look at my weekly skylights where I list them there as well. Occultation. So the only good occultation I picked up on in the next uh, six weeks or so is this rank 99 occultation occurring on December 18th at 1249 a.m. And it's the asteroid Alkesti, um, which will dip in, um, uh, the star will dip in brightness by a magnitude, uh, one magnitude for 6.9 seconds. It's an altitude of 65 degrees in the sky, so it's, it's within the Hyades cluster. And the um, one standard deviation confidence will occur uh, between the blue lines. So it basically runs from Goderich across uh, the northern uh, York region area, Toronto York region area, and over to uh, Kingston area. Uh, lunar occultation. So in the southwestern sky on Thursday the 14th of December, uh, from 621 to 728 p.m., we've got the first quarter moon occulting the star Psi Aquarii. That's kind of in the, in the knee of the water bear. And this is, the view, this is the view at 6.10 p.m., just a few minutes before the uh, first contact with the moon happens. And there are a couple of other occultations to watch for. There's one on the 18th, um, Shai, uh, or Shai Seti, or Seti, or um, Stellarium lists this star as uh, Al-Kafi Al-Hidam II, and that's 5.30 p.m. to 6.47 p.m. And then on the 18th, we've got 54 Orionis uh, in the evening as well, so you can watch for one of those. What's on the constellation? What's on the meridian in um, uh, this time of the year? So you want you want to look at objects when they're on the meridian because they're the highest they'll be in the sky, and you're looking through the least amount of um, interfering Earth's atmosphere. And the light blue circle I've got listed there is showing you what's called um, 1.5 air masses. So anything that's at the zenith will be shining through the least amount of Earth's atmosphere, and when you get down to about uh, 45 degrees or so above the horizon you start getting into more and more atmosphere if you go lower than that. So the constellations that we can look for at their highest around this time of, of the evening at 7 p.m. would be Sculptor and Fornax down over the southern horizon, Cetus a little higher, and then we get into eastern Pisces, Aries, Triangulum, Andromeda, western Perseus, and then cut off at the top of the, the sky chart, we've got Cassiopeia, which is also high in the sky at 7 p.m. A couple of hours later, we pick up uh, Fornax and Eridanus. We've got... Uh, Again, Cetus and Taurus, Eastern Aries, Perseus and Camilla Pardalis, again up above uh, the, in the northern, high northern part of the sky. By 11 p.m., we pick up Columba and Lepus, Orion, Western Gemini, Eastern Taurus, Auriga, and Camilla Pardalis still. And then at by 1 a.m., we've got Puppus, Canis Major, Monoceros, Canis Minor, Eastern Gemini, Western Cancer, and Lynx right up near the top, near the zenith. So what do you want to look at if you... Um, go out observing or maybe uh, get folks together over the holidays for a star party and want to show them some really, really nice things. Uh, we might suggest some holiday packages that will include uh, the Winter Milky Way and Orion's Belt and the Hyades and Taurus and the Square of Pegasus, things that they can see with their naked eye or uh, binoculars. Um, Christmas lights would include the Owl Cluster and uh, the Double Cluster and the Pleiades Cluster, uh, which you could use binoculars or telescopes on. Uh, some of the festive candles in the sky I would call the Orion Nebula, the Heart and Soul Nebula and Cassiopeia. Uh, Christmas ornaments would include uh, M31 and Bode's Nebula, M81 and 82 in Ursa Major, the Blinking Planetary in Cygnus, uh, M56 in uh, Triangulum, and the Blue Snowball in Andromeda. And if you want to make it a double, look for Castor, Almac, and Polaris. And centerpieces would be the big bright stars to point out to them would be Betelgeuse and Rigel, Capella, Aldebaran, etc. So I hope to see everybody at Long Sioux or uh, BB Village, and I'll say thank you. Don't forget it, Ryan. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? So can you go to the uh, image of uh, uh, Binu, please? Shift F5, okay. That's okay. Just, uh, oh, okay. 
Um, what amazes me, and I'm asking you because of your geology background, it, um, the earth bulges out a little bit, but it's always rounded. And that almost seems like you have a, uh, almost a straight line from the North Pole to the equator, and then another straight line to the South Pole, et cetera. You know, and, and I'm just astounded. I presume that's a reflection of the fact that it's gravel, but perhaps you have some insights in terms of that shape. Well, what I thought was interesting was that um, the Hayabusa mission landed at Ryugu uh, a month or so ago, and it's the same shape, almost like a Dungeons and Dragons die. So I, I guess it's a function of it's, it's trying to be round, but it's not quite massive enough to get all the way around. Um, but it is, it is strange that it has that sort of um, two triangles stuck together look. So I don't know what the, what the reason is, but... Um, now we have two samplings, so hopefully we'll come up with some theories as to why that is. But yeah, interesting. No? Great. Thanks. Okay. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. observing to me. Oh, ho. <laughs> take it from the top. Uh, I'm an amateur telescope maker. Uh, I've been interested in astronomy for a very long time, since back in the days of the space race. And I'm a visual observer. Uh, for me, a beautiful aesthetic view of the eyepiece is what it's all about for me. Um, this is my backyard. Not exactly the best place for astronomy, but uh, I like downtown living. And the, the really sad thing is that uh, the seeing is often about as bad as the light pollution. But downtown living does have some advantages even for amateur astronomers. I got a roof that's well high up in the air, and I give a lot of people, a lot of them are students who come and go through the area, uh, their very first look through a telescope. So it's got some advantages as well. I really enjoy dark sky observing as well. Here we are at the Car Astronomical Observatory, uh, where you can see aurora and all kinds of cool stuff. Great place for observing as well. That's a six inch F8 telescope that I'll get onto later. I was a suburban kid. Um, with big floppy Dumbo ears, razor sharp eyes, and an eight o'clock bedtime. So on those rare occasions when I saw the night sky at all, it was uninspiring. But the space race was on, and like every other kid, I dreamed of climbing aboard a great big rocket ship and blasting off into outer space. Just a while after Ed White made his uh, historic uh, spacewalk, my family and I went to a farm where I made some new friends 
and I saw the Milky Way for the first time. Wow. <laughs> that was it. I was done. I was hooked for life. I saw, for the first time, I saw colors in stars. Uh, red and orange and yellow and blue and there were clouds of stars that stretched from horizon to horizon like a million diamonds scattered across black velvet. I perceived space in its true three dimensions and I realized then and there what Carl Sagan used to say that we're all traveling through space, right home here on Spaceship Earth. Well, fast forward about uh, 35 years or so, this is the first telescope I built. I bought uh, two telescopes prior to this. One of them was uh, when I was about 10 years old with a paper route. The very first thing that I bought with the, the money I earned was uh, a telescope, three-inch refractor. It was on a rickety mount and showed lots of false color, but didn't matter. I loved it. And um, I took it out just about every clear night. I much later got a 10-inch Dobsonian that didn't quite cut it for me for observing planets, which was mostly what I liked to do for my backyard in Scarborough at the time. So I built this telescope from an RF Royce design. It's got uh, RF Royce optics down here and protostar secondary. What wonderful scope except for one thing. It was so big that I could break it in half here and put it in the trunk of the car, but it completely filled the trunk of my car, so it didn't leave a lot of room for camping equipment, so it didn't get out to dark sky as often as I might like. So I sold it. And with the proceeds, I bought a 12 and a half inch telescope. That's not it. That's the next telescope that I built. This is a six inch F8. Uh, I wanted something with more portability than the 12 and a half inch. Oh my. Don't know what's happened here. Okay. I don't, um, I wanted something with more portability than the 12 and a half inch. And I was fascinated with the concept of this long tube six inch F8, which had been the standard, um, de facto standard uh, instrument for amateur astronomers for decades. And I was curious to see why. I'd also never owned a uh, equatorial mount, so I thought I'd give it a try. The problem with it was portability. That mount was pretty heavy. It took time to set up. It was more trips to the car along with a battery pack and so on. So eventually I sold it and I built this, a simple Dobsonian mount. This is my most used telescope now, uh, wonderful instrument, the optical tube is the same and uh, it loads in the car in one trip. So uh, it's, uh, I, I just love it. This is the 12 and a half inch uh, telescope that I bought from somebody who was poorly uh, made originally. This one is completely rebuilt. The only thing that uh, is original on this scope was the, uh, the primary mirror, the secondary mirror, and the focuser. Everything else is new. I uh, built that one at the Carr Astronomical Observatory. Optics by Norman Fulham. It is my cure for aperture, fear, fe uh, for aperture fever. First light was at the winter star party in Florida. Uh, clouds prevented me from using it or even trying it um, at home. I met a lot of amateur astronomers and uh, professional astronomers. Uh, this instrument, uh, a long tubed, I think it was a 10 inch F8 as I recall, uh, it was made by a NASA engineer, which is, of course, Cape Canaveral is just up the road. I actually met Al Nagler down there and shook his hand. We had uh, a nice chat. The skies are pretty nice too. The skies were quite steady. And of course, Florida's a lot further south than Toronto. So uh, I could see a lot further south. I could see all kinds of southern eye candy that you just cannot see from southern Ontario. 
to go further south than that, well, I've got this little TV60 apochromatic refractor. Uh, it's handy. It, it's a beautiful scope, punches above its weight, and you can take it just about anywhere. Charlene can tell you it's a wonderful little st scope. But it's still only 60 millimeters. I craved something bigger that I could take on board an airplane. So I really had to consider what did I really, really want. When you build a telescope, it's a pretty big commitment, especially if you build something that's complicated, if you design it from scratch. Uh, so I used Albert, a chapter from Albert Heeg's book to really ask myself some questions that he published in this book, a whole lot of questions you might never dream of. You might recall that that first telescope that I built, that 10-inch F6, was pretty big and it took up so much room in the trunk of the car that it didn't get out to the dark sky very often. I didn't want something like that to happen to me again. So I looked at a lot of these questions and uh, asked myself a lot of serious questions. Mused on it for a long time. Now, you build a telescope around optics. And from my way of thinking, the most important optic of all is right here, it's your eye as a visual astronomer. Of course, if you're uh, an imager, you want to consider your camera chip. You want to build around that. There's a great article in the RESC Observer's Handbook, uh, Telescope Exit Pupils, and uh, it has a bit of a discussion about RFT, Richest Field Telescope. That's where you can get the brightest possible image at the eyepiece for visual observing. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about other size of exit pupil, but that's really what I wanted for this scope. Uh, I measured the entrance pupil of my eye with a bunch of uh, drill bits of different sizes, and I found by this method, holding the drill bits in front of my eye, passing them in front of my eye as I looked at a bright star. If that bright star dimmed but did not disappear, I knew that that drill bit was smaller than the entrance pupil of my dark adapted eye. If it blacked out completely, then I knew the drill bit was larger than my dark adapted eye. By this method, I found that the entrance pupil to my eye was between six and seven millimeters. I, the other critical measure was my favorite uh, wide field eyepiece, a 31 Nagler, the holy hand grenade, the Naglinator. Uh, Thank you, Monty Python. And I plugged those numbers. There is the uh, 31 millimeters for the eyepiece and the 6 millimeter entrance pupil of my eye, and the 31 millimeters and the 7 millimeter entrance pupil to my eye, and came up with these numbers for an optimal uh, focal uh, ratio for the mirror that I would get to build this telescope between f3.9 and f4.5. Now, a little bit about uh, telescope focal ratios. This would mean it would be a fast telescope. I was looking at maybe a 6-inch or 8-inch mirror, and uh, that would be about 32 uh, inches in focal length to the point where that mirror comes into focus. A long focal ratio telescope, twice as long. 8 times 8 is 32, uh, or 8 times 4 is 32, 8 times 8 is 64, twice as long. An example of uh, this uh, uh, short focal ratio one is the one I built right over here. There we go. And an example of the longer focal ratio scope, hey, that's Frank's 8-inch uh, F10. They're both 8-inch telescopes. One of them's a lot longer than the other. By the way, if you have a chance to have a look through Frank's scope at Millennium Square, have a look. There's a reason that there's such a big lineup to get to look through the eyepiece. So I considered different optics. I went with uh, GSO 200 millimeter f4. Uh, with that uh, favored wide field eyepiece, that would give me 30 power with a bright RFT 6.7 millimeter entrance pupil and a 2.7 degree field of view. Uh, just how big is that? Well, that's almost as wide as the belt stars in Orion. That's about half a binocular field. 
that's about the measure of, well, between your pinky and your thumb, about that distance apart. At your, hold your hand at arm's length, Terence Dickinson style, and it's big enough to see a whole lot of nice eye candy. Uh, next step, after I had the optics, was to design the telescope with the help of some online tools that are freely available. I did it the old-fashioned way. Yep, I didn't even have CorelDRAW anymore on my, uh, my uh, computer, so I used uh, pencil, paper, protractor, uh, compass, the old-fashioned way. It did the trick. At some point, I, I think I'll get CorelDRAW again, or maybe even learn AutoCAD. Well, uh, what did Thomas Edison say? Something like, to be an inventor, you need uh, a good imagination and a whole lot of junk. Well, that's, that really sounds a whole lot like uh, amateur telescope makers. This is what I bought this garage sale kit for. I wanted one drum shell. Here it is again. That's going to become part of the telescope. <laughs> yep, right up here, right up there. That's the upper optical assembly. And uh, here it is. Just use an ordinary coping saw. This is up at the car, actually, where I use that coping saw to cut a hole in the drum shell. It was reinforced with uh, half-inch Baltic birch plywood. I'm going to pass this around. It's going gonna, it's gonna to show you uh, the, some finishes, both the interior and exterior, and a little bit of flocking on it. There we go. And uh, Baltic birch was used in this project extensively. Uh, this is the altitude bearing uh, being drilled to save some weight. Uh, this is the cog box, is what I call it. It goes right here in the center of the telescope. It holds everything together. Um, the mirror cell goes in the lower optical assembly down here. Keeps everything all lined up. It is a six-point cell, which a lot of people would consider overkill for an eight-inch mirror. But I figured, hey, why not? If the three-inch point mirror cell is just barely adequate, I thought I'd go for overkill just to be sure I'd have the best possible view at the eyepiece. Baltic birch can even be drilled and tapped uh, like a bolt which is what I made here, a kind of a wooden bolt. I used crazy glue to uh, harden the hole, uh, let it dry thoroughly, then tapped it again, and indeed, it acted much like a bolt. I'll show you where I used that later. Here's the lower optical assembly coming together down here. Uh, the mirror cell and the mirror will fit in here. I used um, epoxy glue to assemble everything. Uh, that's uh, a very strong glue which I also used to coat all of these finished pieces. This is after six days of work. I coated all the wood uh, with epoxy to waterproof it, then sanded it down in preparation for painting. With, uh, you've got a sample out here somewhere. That's what I did for the exterior. This is before painting and after. This is what I used for the paint on the exterior, Rust-Oleum uh, Hammered Black. And I used a bare marquee for the interior surfaces by using a paintbrush and just tapping it over the surface of the, uh, the wood. That gave a kind of a, a dappled, rough finish, which uh, made it seem a little bit blacker than it was with the uh, Krylon Ultra Flat Black, which was the first coat on the interior of the telescope. Next, on to the aluminum. Uh, you can cut aluminum with uh, hand tools, carpentry tools. Uh, I tested parts as I went along. Here's the rocker bars, which will be part of the mirror cell taking shape. Tested the clamps in the cog box. That'll go right over here once again. And the spider is after design by R.F. Royce. It's a curved spider to minimize diffraction from the spider veins. I've, on other telescopes, I've got four vein, straight vein spiders and a three vein spider, which I use in the six inch. Uh, around bright stars and planets, you can see those diffraction spikes. Uh, for this one, they're a lot less visible, barely noticeable, even though it's quite a thick piece of metal. This hobby brass is available from Michaels. 
and say all electronics. Now earlier I mentioned that I drilled and tapped a piece of Baltic birch plywood. Here's what I did. That's actually drilled and tapped. Here is the bolt that fits into it. And uh, the, uh, there's that large, large secondary mirror which is necessary for such a fast telescope. It's such a slow, or such a fast uh, focal ratio. And the curved spider you can see up here as well in the opera optical assembly. Uh, I calculated uh, the uh, truss tube lengths uh, with, uh, did all the trigonometry with an online tool and uh, used a pup pipe cutter to cut the uh, truss tubes to an accuracy within one millimeter. I used a jig to drill all of the tubes to the same length and I also used a jig to drill all of the aluminum parts so that I could have a consistent size from one part to another so that the telescope could assemble um, quite easily. Uh, before I painted them, I did a test assembly of the parts to ensure that the telescope could reach focus with all of my eyepieces. It didn't. Uh, it could focus with some of my eyepieces, but not others. I shortened the focal length of the telescope by about three quarters of the inch, or about uh, two centimeters, and uh, then all of my eyepieces could reach focus. Around the edge of the primary mirror, I put a piece of formica, I glued it in place. That was to support the uh, mirror at its center of gravity. Here's why. This is the lateral bearing to prevent a lateral shift of the mirror, sideways shift. Uh, so that will hold the mirror in place, uh, sideways. And down below, it's a six-point mirror cell. Here you can see four of those points which ride on the rocker bars, which evenly distribute the weight of the mirror. From below, there are three culmination uh, um, knobs which adjust the uh, the mirror cell, which you can see parts of it through a hole where later I will install a fan. From above, here is all six points of the cell, and you might just be able to see these two black Teflon things that the mirror's edge that I showed you earlier will rest against. And there's the mirror in position. You might just be able to see a little bit of those uh, lateral supports. And finally, finally, after about a nine-month gestation period for this telescope, came not first flight, but first light at last. How to do? Pretty good at RFT. Um, I could find objects from that nice wide field of view pretty easily, even without a finder. There's the Swan Nebula through an O3 filter and the Lagoon Nebula. And in between these two objects, I saw all kinds of nebulosity using an O3 filter that I had never seen before. So I was pretty happy about that. I think that's because I had an RFT view. Also had a look at the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, all of the part that you can see visually fit within that uh, uh, 2.7 degree field. Uh, imagers can extend that out to about three degrees. Uh, so that would extend beyond uh, what I could see visually with this scope, but uh, it was a very aesthetic uh, appearance. Just looked dusty, bright, and beautiful. At higher magnifications, say 92 power and above, I found that diffraction started to become an issue and the, the image started to break down. That's the fault of this large secondary mirror. Um, how big? Well, it is about that big. If this is the primary mirror at 200 millimeters, this is 70 millimeters or about 35%. So it's quite large. Um, Ordinarily, with a, a longer focal ratio uh, Newtonian, such as, say, a 8-inch f6, you might find about a 20% secondary, which causes a lot less diffraction, making it suitable for higher magnifications. Uh, according to uh, Texro, uh, if a, a long focal ratio Newtonian with a secondary mirror of just 13% can have 
truly refractor-like views. Uh, so that's an advantage of the long focal ratio telescope. So that's how it did visually. Let's see if I could actually carry this on an airplane. I disassembled it bit by bit and fit it in a suitcase. Yes, it fits. But would it fit within uh, airline baggage restrictions? Yes, it did. <laughs> Still left me a little bit of room for socks and underwear. Uh, so reassembling the telescope, I wouldn't want to try this in the dark because there's a lot of loose parts. I used tools to assemble it. Uh, I didn't think the wing nuts, which I did purchase, would really grip as tight as I'd really want. I want it to really be firmly put together. Uh, this is the lower optical assembly down here, down at the bottom. The lower trusses, which are down below it, uh, and connect that to the cog box, which is the center. The uh, upper uh, tubes up here, the truss tubes, and finally the upper optical assembly at the top of the telescope. The rocker box was next. It uh, fit together kind of like IKEA furniture and finally assembled in 36 minutes. This was the second time that I assembled it from uh, that little pile of junk that was in the, uh, in the suitcase. I've uh, taken it out to Longsu. That is a uh, dark sky observing spot about an hour and a half from home. Um, this is an 8-inch F6 with a longer tube uh, near, nearby. That's somebody else's scope. And the 8-inch F4 is pretty short and stubby by comparison. So after 180 hours of work and $600 to build it, so not a lot of money, but a whole lot of hours. Was it worth it? For me, yes. Uh, it did what I wanted it to do. Um, the question that many of you might be asking is, should I build my own telescope? Well, yeah, maybe, maybe. It's not for everybody, but uh, maybe it is for you. The big question, the big question out of all of these and many more is, hey, ain't it the truth? <laughs> Hey, Newton was, uh, you know, he was the warden of the Royal Mint. He ought to know. Um, you might love building a telescope. Uh, I do because I, that's the main thing for me is that I enjoy doing it. I enjoy building things. I enjoy designing things. But in the end, it's all about a great view at the eyepiece, a really beautiful aesthetic view that reminded me of what I saw when I looked at that night sky for the gorgeous Milky Way when I was a five-year-old kid. By the way, Time is Money was actually written by Benjamin Franklin, not Newton. They say that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, I'm no Ben Franklin. I'm certainly no Newman. Uh, no uh, Newton. Uh, Newman. I'm more like a Newman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, I had a lot of fun building it. And again, we're back in my backyard here. If it wasn't for people like Newton who invented the Newtonian telescope and say John Dobson, pictured earlier by Chris, uh, who designed a simple telescope that, uh, that once you have the optics together, you could maybe put it together in a weekend if you're handy. And many others, Krieg and Barry, and uh, uh, who, and many, many other amateurs and professionals who came up with many different techniques and tools that can uh, help you build a telescope. Uh, and with things like the resources we have now, books, there's the library, there's uh, the internet, we've got fantastic resources now. And uh, if all of these people didn't share with me, there's no way I could have built this telescope. And uh, in gratitude to them and for the car who allowed me to use the Car Astronomical Observatory in part to build this telescope, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. And for this reason, I'm delighted to share with you my experience and a little bit of what uh, knowledge I've learned uh, from this project. For those of you who are interested in maybe making your own telescope, 
I put together a list of some resources I found particularly helpful. You don't need to copy it all down. I'll, I'll put it on a link uh, to my Facebook page and maybe somewhere else on the net. Uh, this is from the RASC Toronto's YouTube channel. So that's about it, everybody. You know, thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. How did you, how did you shorten your focal length? Oh, uh, what I did was I cut the tubes. I used the uh, Clevis Books has published online a right angle triangle calculator. And I, um, uh, I found out, well, I just guessed, well, another three quarters of an inch or so should do it. If I shortened the focal length by that much, I calculated all of the, uh, the truss lengths all over again from scratch, uh, moved uh, the jig, made it uh, a little better or just the right length, and that time it worked without a hitch. No problem. Uh, fascinating uh, project. Um, how far out of collimation does it get? Uh, like, do you have to do a major collimation every time you use it, or does it more or less keep collimation? It, it does a pretty good job of holding collimation, actually. I, um, I suppose that I overbuilt it. At, at this focal ratio, uh, I'm fussy about collimation. So uh, I find I can uh, leave it fully assembled almost all the time. I just uh, re, uh, re I had it assembled actually way back in July. And then the next time that I disassembled it and reassembled it was just this week. So in the meantime, it's been fully assembled that whole time. So um, in that whole time, I've just done minor tweaks to collimation. During the course of a night, I do not need to recollimate even though it's a fast F4. It's, uh, it's a pretty beefy structure, short and stubby and really wide. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's built kind of like a troll, uh, <laughs> uh, shorty. So I'm happy with how it culminates and how it holds culmination. Yes? Question online. Oh, sorry. Uh, question online is how much does it weigh? Uh, that weighs, as I recall, uh, 32 pounds. So I can pick it up and lift it. In fact, uh, let's do that right now, shall we? <laughs> That's a little bit more with the counterweights. There we go. Yeah, not bad. Mm -hmm. With the mirror removed, I have not yet put in uh, a couple of things. I've got a few tweaks to do yet. Uh, but uh, that's with all the toys here, it'll weigh a bit more. But uh, I'm, I'm really pleased with it all in all. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, the um, illustration of Andromeda before, mm -hmm. was that a sketch? Or was oh, that, that wasn't a sketch. No, that was a NASA picture. <laughs> uh, was that a picture like you just go in and you see it right on the spot like that? or? Uh, that was pretty close to the naked, or at the naked eye view. That Very was pretty detailed. close to the telescopic view. Right. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I got an image off the net that NASA produced. Uh, that was in full color. I just uh, took out the color, and that was pretty close. Uh, in this image, it would extend a bit more than what I actually saw at the eyepiece. But um, uh, you cannot see all of the Andromeda galaxy uh, visually, you need to image it in order to get it out to that full three degrees. So it fit well within a 2.7 degree field of view. But uh, it, it was a beautiful view. One of, my, uh, one of my favorite appearances of the galaxy is beautiful in any scope. Yes? Uh, I probably will. I think I'll pack it in styrofoam and put it in the, the suitcase just so the, the edges don't get shipped. Uh, one little job that I've got to do is put in some nylon bolts to uh, hold it in place so that I can leave the mirror and at least when I'm going, uh, got it in the trunk of my car. Yes, Ed. Here? Yep. Yes. I find it interesting that you designed it around the eyepiece, uh -huh. it sounds like. 
what happens if you find a new favorite eyepiece? <laughs> I guess I'll just have to make another telescope. I'm always astonished in the way you guys build telescopes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one thing to see a telescope in a magazine or online. It's another thing to actually see the actual fruits of your labor. Uh -huh. So I just, and the design is amazing. I, I walked in, I thought that was something that you bought, mm -hmm. not realizing there was something that you made. So great job. Thank you very much. Um, do it, the tools they use, were they use your own tools, or did you have to go out and get the tools you needed in order to build it? Uh, the, only t whoops. the only tool that uh, I don't have that I really need um, was a table saw, which they've got at, uh, at the car. And there's also various workshops around Toronto that uh, have a table saw. All the other tools I've got... Um, Used to be a homeowner a million years ago, and uh, I, I was pretty handy. Another question online: Is there an official group of amateur telescope makers? Uh, official group? I think that a lot of astronomy uh, clubs do have uh, collectives of um, uh, people who build telescopes. Also, uh, I'm a member of Facebook. There are at least two amateur telescope making um, groups there. One of them is Telescope Making South Africa, and there's another one as well, its name I can't recall right now. But uh, there, there are uh, amateur telescope making groups and forums and things. Online is a great resource. Uh, right here in southern Ontario, there are so, some very advanced uh, uh, amateur telescope makers, much more advanced than me. Not, not in uh, this, for the city of Toronto or GTA area? Uh, that would be a good question for Allard. Uh, I believe that there is. Uh, he could fill you in on the details. Great. Any more questions? No, we're good? Okay, great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just a few announcements before we move on to the annual meeting. Our next uh, meeting is January 16th. That's going to be a speaker's night. And Paul Delaney is arranging the, uh, the speakers for uh, the next few months before he disappears on his next sabbatical uh, from January until June. So uh, before he makes his, uh, his big getaway, he's going to give me a list, right? I will. I, I've got a couple of things nearly on the book for January. Yeah. Okay, so 40 years, uh, so the February talk is 40 years uh, celebration of the great 1979 solar eclipse. I still remember that one. It was so darn cold. Uh, 
and, and the other thing was that uh, the night before that, uh, before we left, uh, my car decided to fry its electronics uh, circuits at the corner of Davenport and uh, Christie. And I had to get it towed, unload the stuff, and get out to the airport to catch the plane. That was a stressful night. Uh, <laughs> anyway, well, we'll look forward to uh, that in February, and we'll see whatever uh, the January talk is and uh, get that online uh, as soon as we can. Anyway, uh, the next recreational um, uh, astronomy night is on uh, Wednesday, January 30th. And uh, the slides got sent to Andrew before we uh, got the information, but uh, Sky This Month um, will be presented by Andy Beaton uh, that evening. And we've got Blake talking about outreach at the David Dunlap Observatory. And then Henry Lowton is going to talk about a project that he's been working on which is a new planetarium for Toronto. Uh, planetariums rise and fall, and uh, they come and uh, projects come and go here in Toronto. And uh, Henry's going to be talking about his latest effort to uh, get a replacement for the McLaughlin. So that should be interesting to hear what he's got to say. Next solar observing uh, session is going to be on Saturday, January the fifth. Uh, Next year, what we're going to do is go back to what we did before, which is holding the solar observing sessions on the first Saturday of every month. Uh, we tried to do it uh, this year, moving it around uh, choosing the weekend according to the lunar phases, thinking that that might make it a little bit easier for uh, people to plan their observing. What we found was it was more confusing than anything else. So we're going to go back to the old thing. And so, uh, again, first Saturday of every month will be our regular uh, event with the backup uh, for bad weather being the following week. Uh, we've also gotten the uh, dark sky and city star party dates set up. And so what we have is uh, the next dark sky star party will be first clear night of the week of 14th of January at Long Sioux. And then the first city star party is uh, first clear night of the week of January 7th. Uh, uh, again, watch out for uh, the go or no go uh, messages on uh, the website, uh, on the forum, and on our various social media. We also have a tentative date for uh, the first of six uh, evening, sol uh, evening observing parties at the Science Center. Uh, this is subject to confirmation, uh, but uh, Rachel has proposed three nights in the winter, so that'll be uh, one night in each of uh, January, February, and March, uh, running from about 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. when the Science Center is open. And uh, the idea would be to have the uh, telescopes out on the telescape, uh, and uh, we would do the usual go, no-go kind of arrangement uh, for these events as well. Uh, oh, yeah. That, that, <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah, that should be 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. <laughs> hey, it's winter. It's an all-nighter. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's a, a typo. Um, but um, anyway, so our first of these events, subject confirmation, uh, will be on January 12th. And uh, we are looking for somebody to help us out as a coordinator for the event uh, through the uh, uh, year. So anyway, we'll see how this works out. Uh, also, remember that the CAR Observatory is available for your use uh, throughout the year. Uh, at the moment, the road is now closed. Uh, there's plenty of snow on the road, so it doesn't look too bad. But if you try to drive into it, you'll not get out until the spring. So um, uh, what we have is an arrangement with some of our neighbors uh, for parking spaces on the, uh, on the road um, on the hillside above the observatory and uh, you walk in, and again, if you're interested, uh, you can book those, uh, you can book to uh, go into the observatory, and uh, Laura Chow will give you the information on where to park and what to do. So again, um, winter access uh, uh, place is still available, although there isn't any supervisor scheduled to open up the uh, GDO, but there's plenty of instruments up there if you don't want to bring your own. 
Okay, and uh, telescope uh, loan program, again, for uh, everybody, I'd like to remind you that uh, we've got plenty of equipment that's available for loan, and we've got some uh, recently donated equipment that may find its way into that as well. So um, lots of uh, goodies to try out. Uh, try before you buy or just keep trying, uh, one or the other. But a uh, lot of good instruments there that you can use. Okay, and then finally, uh, the meeting after the AGM uh, will be at the Granite Brew Pub uh, as soon as we can get done with the annual meeting. So that's it for now. Uh, we're going to have a brief break to set up for the AGM, and then we'll be back shortly with all the reports on what has gone on in the last year. Thanks very much. One, one little yep. thing, Ralph, on the table here. Uh, Tess is generously going to some uh, Christmas suckers. And ah, how to go we have some Christmas candy goodies candy there. So Thank you very much, Tess. Anybody can grab whatever. Yeah. Doesn't want to take it home with us, so just take it. Yeah. Take it so home. those of you who are on the streaming, this is what you're missing. <laughs> so sometimes it pays to turn up. Okay, so we'll be back in a few minutes with the AGM. Uh, stand by for that.